We're going to hear about the Colorado Flight Alliance. And the Colorado Flight Alliance, or CFA, leads the economic development of Colorado's Western Slope through air service development and corresponding marketing programs. We're going to learn how CFA develops air service to the region, including how the CFA partners with the airline industry to make these flights happen. Since 2004, Colorado Flights has provided 2 million air seats for the region. Are you like those numbers? The little, okay, we'll use those numbers. Then. Okay, we'll use those. <laughs> How about the losses? With the three times multiplier, total economic benefit to the region is estimated at $3 billion, or is it more now? More than that, wow, that's pretty amazing. So anyway, today I'm happy to announce, um, introduce Matt Skinner, the COO, or the Chief Operating Officer of Colorado Flights Alliance. Yes. So you, you said something, that, I don't know if my hearing aids are working properly or not, but was that three billion? Yes. Uh, let's just hold on. That's why I don't like numbers in the introduction, especially <laughs> in this crowd. Every time I get the hot water in Montrose, it's because of this exact thing. So let's back up. <laughs> And, and that was something from, actually it's funny because it caused me to update my website. There was an old page with some old data that we had done research on. And this is over the period of 16 years now, right? This is not like, hey, last year we put $3 billion into the town itself. No, that's not the case. So it's a long-term look at tourism, a long-term look at air service. It's a fully collaborative piece of the puzzle. And that helps me kind of get into my intro. Anyway, thanks for having me back. It's always good to see you guys. I always love coming to the forum. This place is phenomenal. I have not been out here at all. I've, you know, I've heard about it with the investment that built over the last couple of years. I, I'm one generation off the ranch in Southeast Oregon, and when we would always go back to my family ranch to the rodeo, it was 100 degrees in a rickety old, you know, splinter in your butt <laughs> stadium, you know, watching the kids run around trying to find cans for a nickel kind of rodeo, and this is a totally different experience. Uh, that I'll be able to bring my kids to. So I'm pretty excited about this and just really phenomenal uh, addition to Montrose. So uh, thanks for having me down again. And that's basically I was asked today just to kind of go back to the 101. It's just like how this works. And so, you know, feel free to jump in with questions. Uh, you know, we can't get too, too detailed on, on the specifics of each airline, but just like in general how it works and then how we go after our different projects and, and what we hope to bring to the community is ultimately the goal of this. You know, we're a nonprofit. There is no you know, agenda for Colorado flights and success. Our success is, is on the back of economic development and successful economic sustainability for the region. And we look at ourselves as a regional play, obviously, uh, with partners up and down um, um, the corridor. So, you know, as she had mentioned, we basically pull on lovers, uh, airline, marketing, and then the partnerships that run between. Uh, we have a ton of partners in the region. It's a public-private partnership. There are taxes in Telluride and Mountain Village that fund us with restaurant and lodging. Uh, City of Montrose supports us annually. Uh, we have uh, retail shops all through uh, the mountains up there, both sets of the large companies, we'll call them. The real estate uh, agents all contribute. Uh, we have a bookstore that puts in and uh, a candy store and folks who recognize the value. You know, the town of Uray helps out when they can through the CDD when we can help them with studies with information, data, et cetera. And basically it's just recognizing the, the economic benefit that flights can bring to a region. Uh, you can see it, it runs across, you know, from governments down to small businesses. And so that's where we're hoping to drive benefit for it, hopefully creating a success story, you know, for those people with the people that we both bring to the region, with the businesses that we can attract, uh, with outgoing traffic, et cetera. And so it's a very holistic view that we try to take into this thing, you know, with tourism kind of being the horse that we rode in here, right? That was the main driver for this. I mean, my, my favorite example is Jackson Hole. Jackson Hole has great winter air service, but they didn't used to have any because all their air service was built off of Yellowstone Park traffic in the summer. And they took that and crossed it over and built it. It's a very successful winter program. We rode winter tourism into this equation and basically now trying to expand it into year-round flights, into year-round you know, support for all the economic sectors that, that need air service or that can benefit from it. And so we try to take that piece and that advantage, I guess, and leverage it uh, for a bigger view. In a quick nutshell, there's our funding. We kind of talked about that. <coughs> Breaks up through the region. This is sort of the how-to, and you know, I'll kind of jump in. 
So first thing we do is our homework. Uh, we take a look at where all the local folks are traveling. Where is the business demand? That makes up about 20 to 25 percent of the traffic on our flight. So originating here is what they call it. It goes outbound from Montrose, Telluride, Uray, Delta, Grand Junction, etc., going out. So we take a look at where that traffic is, where it's sustained, what the demand is. And we look at the you know the bigger piece of the pie, the 75 percent of who's originating or starting somewhere else and flying in here. And we slice it and dice it and and bury ourselves in data that I will not bore you with. <laughs> but we also then combine with our other partners. You know, whatever information we can get from Tyrex Ski Resort, who tracks their guests. Where are the real estate guys getting the most buys from? Where's the real estate development happening down in Montrose? Where, what's going on in your ray as far as, as you know, economic health? You know, what business development, especially here, talking to the Mayfly guys, talking to uh, OBT and, and to the town, like where are the targets right now? I sent out two packets last week to Texas for other businesses that are being courted here and for another hotel actually up the valley. And so we try to work in all of those sectors to make sure that they have the information you know, pertinent to making a decision hopefully to locate here. Uh, all that goes into the hopper and we create targets. And with that, we're looking to create airline networks. So we don't want just one airline flying from one place, right? Uh, and as you can see from this lower map, you know, our, our heat, like the, the hot spots, unfortunately are very sp thinly spread over a very large geographic area. So we're not able just to pick one market, unfortunately, and drill for oil there. And so what we, what we end up doing is partnering with airlines that are strong in each of the regions. So, you know, Delta is super strong in Atlanta. American has Dallas. Uh, American and United are in Chicago. And so each of these airlines has networks that, that do actually regionally serve parts of the country. And so over the last several years, and luckily we've been pretty successful with this, with Delta coming along, um, <laughs> that we are, have been able to create a couple pretty good networks uh, that, that cover us pretty well. You know, we have a few future charts, but we're pretty happy with our hubs right now, you know, with daily flights. And that's kind of the big, one of the big pieces today. Chicago out of, out of or sorry, United out of Chicago is like on the verge of going daily. They're gonna fly through the fall this year. So we'll have three flights out of Montrose Airport. Uh, all the way through the next spring, and I, I can't call it year-round yet because they haven't loaded in April and May, but that's that, those are the things that we like to see. And then in the winter, we shoot straight into New York, we shoot into Atlanta, we shoot hard into LA, into San Francisco, and are able to tap those markets and stimulate those markets for added traffic, which then hopefully generate in Phoenix, I gotta mention Phoenix, uh, hopefully build themselves into the next year-round flight, which then of course dovetails in with you know other businesses that need year-round service. Uh, their local business travel that has that demand, and so all building upon each other. The how-to is, is interesting. I was trying to think of a good analogy on the way over here. So the airlines have these very mobile assets that they can put anywhere, and they're very expensive. And so what we try to do is explore who the best partners could be, and we talk to every airline, large and small. Uh, when we lost our service at the <coughs> airport, I learned so much about charter airlines, I don't ever want to go back. <laughs> it is crazy the next level down. And it was very unhealthy, actually, for the airline industry at the time. There were all those little charter companies were going out of business with the pilot shortage and other factors. And it's actually come back now. And so that's leading to the bigger question of we're seeing a pretty healthy airline industry. But there's not too many major players now. The, uh, the low-cost carriers are actually doing pretty well and pushing forward. And we're lucky as a mountain destination to have one here in Allegiant. And then there's the big four, right? Um, and, and so we try to make sure that we're speaking with everybody. And basically, we go to them with all of our homework and show them, and they have good homework too, believe me, and, and show them where we have market demand. Where, hey, you know, I've got, you know, let's say, 30,000 people a year at, at the time flying from Chicago, but they're all connecting through Denver and so through Dallas, where you think about a nonstop flight. So they look at that information, put it together, and they say, you're right, you're right. We think there's enough market demand, let's put in a nonstop flight. And so, and I, and I always hear analogies that we buy empty seats on airplanes, and that's not, it, there's, there's different shades of gray to how this conversation can be pitched, but that's not really how it works. And, I, and this was the best analogy I could come up with, and you can tell me if you can think of a better one. Think about your car, you're gonna go on a road trip. Right? There's a bunch of things that go into that car to get you to the other place. First, you've got to buy the car. There's ownership. You've got to put tires on the car. You've got to put gas in the car. That's a very big one in this industry. So there's a bunch of costs associated. You've got to have a driver for the car, let's say. Uh, you, you have a bunch of buried costs in these, in these assets, in these aircraft that these airlines have. 
And basically, it takes a certain amount of money, a minimum amount of revenue, to run that airplane from one place to another. And so what we do with them is basically agree on a certain amount that is going to be, is going to be the cost plus some profit for them for that airplane to fly from Chicago to Montrose, let's call it. And so at that point, we take the risk out of it for them. And so what we hope then is that that plane fills all the way up and the amount of revenue actually exceeds that agreed upon cost to get that plane, that car back and forth from Chicago to Denver. And once it exceeds that cost, then our costs either go down or go away. And so in the first couple of years, you can imagine, we're trying to build up the passengers on those flights. We take on a lot of the costs, all right? We, we end up at that guarantee, because they can take that plane and fly it between New York and Boston and make X amount. So that's kind of what they're basing it on, right? We want to make sure that we have this amount of revenue associated with this plane. And so at that point, we try to take, you know, make sure that they're whole, that they're getting their, you know, coverage and profit margin with that plane to choose us. And so at that point, then we do everything we can on the marketing side to put butts in those seats. <laughs> and so it's both here and coming in. And so first year, second year, third year, we tend to spend pretty heavily as the route builds, as the market builds, uh, and a very collaborative effort through the entire region. Everybody marketing different phases of the year, etc. Then hopefully over time, it gets down to nothing. And then they'll take that guarantee off the flight, and we can take those resources and apply it to another one. And that's basically just how it works. It's not super complicated, uh, but at the same time, you have to make sure that all the, the, the wheels are humming. You know, we've had some we've had some dogs over the years. You know, things that we tried that just didn't work. You know, we had a lot of demand for a low cost flight to Denver, but it needed to be daily. And the one that we put in was two days a week, and I think it was the probably the worst load factor we've ever had on a flight. We tried Vegas once, and so these are the, the stories where you know we're trying different things with those resources. But we've also had some great success stories, and I think the last few years we are in the room. Oh, there's the marketing slide. I'm getting ahead of myself. There's where we market collaboratively. And so over the last several years, we've had pretty good success. Montrose is still the fastest growing airport in the state, and I think we're not in any position to lose that title this year. So summer's really been the big story. We came out of the recession with some pretty poor summer service. Uh, so you know, take the percentages for a grain with a grain of salt. Right, uh, we've grown by 100% over the last five years. We've doubled the service in here. Uh, we've got daily flights out of Chicago now, Houston, as I, or as I mentioned, Chicago, Houston, Dallas. You know, Houston used to be twice a week on a 50 seat jet. You know, it's daily now with a bigger jet on Saturdays. You know, Dallas is three times a day this last July, twice a day with a big jet, like mixing up winter and summer. Uh, Phoenix is back to daily, etc. So we're very proud of that. But that's also part of that larger plan I was talking about, where. You can't get to year-round unless you build both seasons first and then kind of fill in the shoulder, right? And so that's kind of the object of this. And also why this looks a little simpler. You know, in winter we're pulling from, we have a lot more drive tourism and a lot more local business traffic. And in winter our market and our reach is actually a little broader. But this also helps kind of what we call our core hubs. And those core hubs we want daily year-round service on eventually. New York, I don't know if we need to go daily year-round anymore but it'd be sure nice to have daily service in both the winter and the summer. And so there's different targets for different markets, right? So these in the summer right now are kind of what's on the list for, for trying to get to that year-round piece. Winter has 11 hubs now, and we do finally have service, and it's crazy on a jet into Telluride, but it's all of 30 seats a day, and I think maybe three or 5% of our total service. So obviously Montrose is still the workhorse of the region, and that's, that's a nice highlight, but not adding a ton. So winter, uh, we've grown about 50% over the last five years. It's leading our, leading our comp sets as well, uh, and, and just trying to stimulate markets. And we've done all kinds of, of research again about how direct flights do stimulate markets. You will actually gain market share and cause people to come to you with that ease of travel. I have two little kids now, six and eight, and she just turned six. And so I have to admit, I have finally started to behave this way myself, where I'm like, I'm definitely not connecting twice. And if I can help it, I'm not going to even connect once. <laughs> so at this point, you know, I, I get that whole thing. But there's also cities, and it's funny not to go too deep, there's cities that behave that way. San Francisco and Chicago have some of the best service, air service in the country. They don't connect. They literally like, will not get on a second flight almost. We've tried it through different things. Uh, and so it's funny, because they, they can fly anywhere at one stop. However, New Yorkers, Bostonians, to some degree Atlantans and South Florida, they're okay connected, you know, they're used to it, and so they'll get out there one way. So you have to like take each market 
and, and really get to know, you know, and this is over the years of working with the ski resorts, with the summer resorts, etc. You know, who's going to do what, who needs what. Um, there's our comp set just real quick. We are leading our state. There's one caveat here. I, re I learned lately, Sun Valley, I'm from Idaho again, near that southeast Oregon, because I was also doing very well. It's kind of up competing with us. And Jackson Falls is <coughs> in the middle there. Is this Matt, state. can you just tell us what those say? We can't read them in the back. Like, what are our comparable? Oh, yeah, sorry. So I, this is just the Colorado resorts. So that's Durango over the last five years. They're about flat. Eagle's about flat. Junction's up 6%, but they're really actually coming back right now. They're going to gain in the bubble in the bubble phase right here. There's Steamboat. Gunnison has actually just now come back. That had been actually negative numbers until this year. and They have a smaller number of flights, so it's fairly healthy for them. Aspen's the only one that's really been keeping pace with us. And it's a pretty big number of seats. They, as... No, we'll leave it at that. And then we're on, as the percentages go, that's us at the, at the top bubble there. And then, just again, adding some out-of-state competitors. Jackson's done very well. They're kind of in the Aspen zone. And Sun Valley, even though they probably have only about 65% of the number of seats that we do, has about an equal percentage of growth over the last five years. They've been doing well. They figured out, as the text challenges go, Sun Valley figured out how to land an E-175, which is a large regional jet at their airport, which Again, having grown up in that area, I was stunned, but <laughs> they pulled it off, and I think that they, uh, they increased some safety areas at that airport, etc., uh, but it's helped them grow quite a bit. So, again, we're doing very well in the recent trend. You know, we're obviously paying very close attention to macroeconomics as well, and trying to be conservative of where we're, where we're going forward. That's kind of where I'll, I'll finish this up. So, the economic benefit, before we get into the weeds, <laughs> just to mention, we did a co-op study with the city of Montrose this past year, just to try to put some hard numbers to this. The stuff that you had, the reason I cut you off is from old surveys, and basically just kind of an eyeball, right? This is more an annual look. This is 2017, and basically it takes a holistic look at tourism. We weren't really able to get into economic development on the business side. It's very hard, it's very difficult to put a quantifiable number to that. And so there's layers of other benefit to the air that we hope is trickling, and we believe is trickling, and we know fairly well that it's trickling through uh, the regional economy. I think the one thing that we learned is that our regional economy is very much more intertwined than, well, it's actually just about as intertwined as we suspected. You know, a thousand people commuting up and down the road in the course of a year, 225 businesses in Montrose and Uray with business licenses in Telluride Mountain Village. Uh, what was it? I forget the number of spending. The amount of spending that comes from the mountain communities down into Montrose each year. The only number that stuck in my head is $10 million in cars for some reason. But there's all kinds of information in this study uh, about how we're intertwined. And so, you know, really this is just us trying to deliver. This is our responsibility. You know, this is what we've been tasked with. And so we look at jobs and economic benefit. Are we helping provide jobs? The airport, you know, tourism provides almost 8,000 jobs in the region. Montrose is responsible for about half of that. And then we take our part, you know, just in looking at that. And that was more to dig into it for the city uh, to make sure that we, you know, we were delivering. And so, you know, tourism is an important industry here. You know, it, it, it goes up and down the corridor. It supports the city in a number of ways. It's not the core business in Montrose, but it's the core business up the valley, and those people spend their money down here. And so it really does all come back to, you know, one global inter interrelated region. Um, you know, and for us, Um, for us, it's just trying to make sure that, that, that we are delivering. And so, you know, one of our core tenants is being responsive to our stakeholders. You know, we try to listen to make sure, you know, people call me with different things, you know, all the time. And it ranges from larger business developments down to how do I book a flight? You know, and generally we're not on the front end of how to book a flight. The next slide is we are going to get into that a little bit. Um, but, but really we want to hear, you know, as with the private group that came to me a couple weeks ago and said, hey, we have a possible business partner out of Texas. Can you talk to them? It's like, absolutely. And so whatever we can do for you, whatever you're seeing in your businesses, whatever the challenges are from your businesses, what went right, what went wrong, you know, we're, we're, we're here, we're a community organization. And so we do want to hear all of that. You know, we have to take the broader swaths, we have to put all that information together, but we want to hear the individual accounts as well. And so it all goes into that hopper of how to make good decisions for us going forward, where we need to develop, how we need to both partner and compete with Grand Junction and Durango, you know, how we want to go out there and take some more share in the ski industry and all the different pieces of the puzzle that, that help make this successful. I think we're in a really unique situation here where, 
you know, there's nowhere else in the country with three regional airports the size of ours within this small of a region. So having Grand Junction an hour up the road and Montrose here, along with Durango, just a couple hours over the hill there, is pretty, it, it, it's not common in the post-regionalization era. And I mean, that's when a lot of smaller airports closed because people went to use the bigger ones, right? And so we have done a great job out here and are very lucky, I think, in a lot of ways to have diversified industries, diversified economies, diversified drivers. You know, Junction and Durango are very much business economy centric, right? We're going to be able to use tourism to help drive the business side of the equation here, sort of the middle, what do we call this area? The middle 550? <laughs> um, and so I think that, you know, that, that we're, we've got a lot of advantages. And, and I think we'll be able to use those to really help develop, you know, everything up and down the corridor. And as that individual stakeholder piece goes, one call that we do get, like we're very business to business facing, we don't generally deal with the customer, but our locals always are asking about the fares. And fares are actually 10% lower than they were five years ago. They're never gonna go back to 2004, but they're, they're, they're not bad right now. But at the same time, it's also more interesting or, and more complicated in some ways than how you search for fares. So we're gonna try to provide, and you know, don't expect like, global and instant solutions and it takes a little work on your end but we're going to provide a fair search service called Montrose Flyer and sorry we, we, we built the Telluride Flyer first and so um, so there's some Tellurides in here but basically if you guys have ever heard of Scott's Cheap Flights it's, a, it's another national level one of these that you might want to use Scott's Cheap Flights you pick a few airports you pick Montrose you pick Denver and they go through and search fares all over the world every day. And then they send them to you in your inbox. Like some of them are more pertinent to what you need to do. And some of them are like, oh my God, I can get to Bali for 400 bucks. Maybe we should go to Bali. And so <laughs> it's kind of fun. And this is kind of like that too. You know, they're going to search for different fares at, uh, out of the Montrose and Telluride airports and send them out to you all in emails and have a website where they basically sit. And so we're calling it Montrose Flyer. It's probably going to launch in the next week or two. Basically, here's a mock-up of the website and a mock-up of the emails that would come to you, and I know this is gonna to be too small on here. Sorry, I need to swap the logo out, but like Montrose to Toronto, Montrose to Portland, Montrose to Scotts Bluff, Montrose to Czech Republic, and so all of those kinds of things. Um, the one caveat to this, and it goes back, the Denver route costs are going to remain the same, just because that's our function in the United, uh, in the United system. So you will be able to occasionally find you know, cheaper Denver flights, but for Denver business, those fares, like, I just don't, I want to manage expectations because it's the one question I always get. That Denver route is a business feeder for United. They know it's business travel and they want us to fly into their networks and they generally keep from Hayden, from Aspen, from Steam, or from, uh, from Eagle, ourselves, all, they keep those fares pretty consistent because it's, it's feeding their larger network. One highlight on that, for the last two years, we were cheaper than Junction to Denver on an annual basis. So we actually have, through competition, managed to beat those fares down a little bit, but they're going to remain fairly the same. But this will help you with probably broader travel and, and get you out there. Um, and, and just something nice, and, and it's total data, right? It's the first time we've tried this, so send me your friendly feedback and let me know if it's working, not working, uh, and if there's fun stuff you find on there, if there's useful stuff. Um, basically, all you gotta do is just go sign up with your email once we get this thing rolling, and I'll use our community partners here to get the word out uh, to you. And then we also have on Colorado Flights, we have a newsletter list on there as well if you wanna come sign up for that. Um, in short order, I wanna take questions, but I, I, I just do wanna make a joke too because I really appreciate everybody kind of sitting through this with us because next week, you're gonna have a lot more fun than this. <laughs> Uh, with Lloyd, who is here in the room now, and I think the meeting's at the airport. You guys are going to get to go get on a B1. Is that correct, Lloyd? B17. B17, and so that's pretty awesome. So we tried to tie the air service pieces together. Um, I, you know, the one thing I didn't mention in here, and I'm sorry, I really meant to, is like when you look at our funding and our participation, the two counties and the two airports don't directly fund this organization, but the way that they heavily participate is through capital investment at the airport. And so Lloyd will be showing you what we've got going on and what they've got going on, I should say, in fair terms. This year, the Telluride Airport just did something similar uh, in, in improving their whole room, and, and they invest, I mean, it's millions of dollars over years uh, into those airports, et cetera. And so that's kind of my throw out to those guys for next week, and you should really get out there because it's a pretty unique opportunity. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and have, take some questions. Any questions? Oh, yes. So I have a question about your uh, participating uh, stakeholders. Um, you 
said, uh, they showed on the early slide that 8% uh, comes from the city of Montrose. And you also said that um, when you entered the, uh, the, the business, uh, you're based on winter travel. So as the uh, uh, tourism starts going through summer and everything, uh, you know, changes, are you, um, would you, uh, are you under pressure to adjust those percentages? So in other words, Montrose would pay more and tell you rather pay less because uh, Montrose benefits. I mean, how do those discussions go? You know, everybody's very fair and equal-minded, actually, among the stakeholder groups. And, you know, if you had to cut to a hard percentage of investment versus an economic benefit, Montrose is as high than 8%, as you can imagine, because of all the money, you know, maybe as direct spending goes, that might be about, and actually it's probably low even for direct spending, but because of the secondary and tertiary effects of those dollars going into the mountains and then coming back down here, Montrose's overall economic benefit is actually a pretty good percentage, Montrose County, a pretty good percentage higher than 8%. Nobody's cutting it up like that, luckily, at the table. Everybody's behaving simply as, as recognition of, as this is kind of a global economic driver and everybody doing what they need to do to benefit from that on that end. And so at this point, uh, we just we don't approach it that way. We certainly talk with the city and, and are working on ways, you know, we'd love to get off the general fund, just to be straight up. I've been in dog fights over lodging tax in three different mountain towns right now, and you just don't want to ultimately be on the general fund. You want to find a tax, a lodging tax, a restaurant tax, or something to help fund tourism promotion and air and a couple of other things. And so that's something we'd actually love to do here, is we would love to see increased funding out of Montrose, but also to work with the city to find a way to do that, that it's not putting a burden on them and any of their other you know, projects, capacities, you know, all the bigger things that they want to do for the city down here. You know, we want to be a good partner in that, but, but certainly, and we work on the same conversation with our other partners up the valley as well. You know, where are the increases over time? As the costs of, of air service go up, so does our risk, and so does our cost in developing something new. And so we certainly have those conversations kind of through the stakeholder group. It's a good question. A few years back, Allegiant had a direct flight between Montrose and Denver for $49. Every time I flew on it, the airplane was empty. Nobody knew about it. I think they only flew two or three times a week. But boy, if they had an everyday flight and got the word out, a lot of people would be rather flying for $49 to Denver instead of driving it for five hours on I-70. So I don't know why they don't advertise that. I know they're not part of a normal group where you can get them on, get the tickets on orbits, but nobody ever knew about it. Actually, awareness wasn't our issue. It was, you know, we advertised that thing up and down the 550 corridor. Everybody was pretty well aware that there was a low-cost flight to Denver. And this is three years ago, as far as we could tell in the side of a single year. Because it had been the number one asked for thing in our region, and so we delivered it. And I, I don't know if you walked in late, we kind of joked about this earlier, but it was the worst load factor in the history of our program. <laughs> and so, and the most expensive. And so as you can imagine in my analogy, if like, let's say you needed to drive your car with the tires and the ownership and the gas and the driver, and it cost you 100 bucks to drive that car to Denver, but you're only putting $35 worth of revenue on there, which would be about the percentage if you had a $49 ticket, that's gonna cost you basically your annual budget. And so the problem is, is you need to find a balance. Now the day you hit it on the head with the challenge with that flight was, and this is what told us, you know, we got the feedback of, of that Denver flight, right? Everybody wanted to fly to Denver for cheap. But what it is, is it's the business folks. And so a Wednesday, Saturday, and that's how you normally build air service. You started on Saturday, then you had Wednesday, then you had Friday, Sunday, etc. and you build it up to daily. And so with what we saw, there was very little leisure demand for that flight. So it was the business folks who we've been hearing from. And that's a Monday to Friday, actually Sunday to Friday daily exercise. And so Allegiant's not really a fit for that. They don't fly daily just to start with, and it would be very, very expensive to fly a 166-seat airplane up and back from there. And so it's not to say that we're not looking for other partners. United, though, is our number one partner. You've got to be careful. If you want to come undercut your number one partner, we have a major national network with those guys. So you want to find a way to do it professionally and, and equitably. Uh, but the way that we manage that then is to build competition. And so unfortunately, like without having a silver bullet, like you know, there's Denver Air at a, at a junction, which is a good option. Sometimes, uh, you know, even the Telluride flights are actually cheaper. 
uh, if you guys want to drive up there. But the way that we manage that and the way that we've gotten it down below junction over the last three years, two years, is by building competition. You know, that Dallas flight actually does compete with the Denver flight as a major hub. You know, I hope you guys are looking at America when you fly out of here to get back east, etc. Because flying through Dallas is just as easy as flying through Denver, and, and those two now competing will help bring those prices down. And so that's basically the way we manage it. You know, if you want me to get deeper into why those fares stay the same, I, I can give you just a couple more added details. United competes heavily, all the airlines, from hub to hub. So let's call it Boston to Denver. They're only charging like 200 bucks, right? And so for each mile, they're not making a lot of money. Us, Aspen, Durango, Junction, we put people in to Denver and then through to Boston at a higher rate. And so they're gonna make a little more money between Denver and Boston off of our $400 ticket than the $200 ticket that they made out of Denver. So we're feeding their system. So they don't want us to fly just to Denver, right? They want us to fly to Boston at a little higher rate. And so they protect it, right? And they also know, unfortunately, they don't make all their money off of leisure travel. The bread and butter of major airlines is business travel. Close in, expensive business travel. And so unfortunately, they figured out, and they know that when we're trying to fly to Denver, most of the time it's business, and then we're gonna end up paying it anyway. And so those flights have been full, even at the fares that we have, as, as low, you know, lower that they are now. And so again, that's the second reason why they protect that Denver route. And so again, we have to go to the competition you know, strategy to try to drive those prices down, which you've had some success at, but I get that it's still, you know, 385 might be the cheapest now, and 500 bucks is pretty average, and if you're last minute, it's probably eight. And, you know, feel good about it, though. If it's last minute, I'd tell you right, the last couple years, it's like 12, so. <laughs> oh, those fares do sound pricey, but I was so happy to hear about, you know, the new bargain hunting fares, as I love bargains. bit about your um, reliability as far as like canceled flights or um, delayed flights I, you know I know we have weather here but um, it seems like that's been a little bit of a problem in the past and I was hoping that we could increase that reliability actually this is going to sound very opposite to what you're saying we have the most reliable mountain airport in the country um, this is the biggest advantage that this region has is that this airport is basically Denver. It sits at the same altitude, it has a 10,000 foot runway, or near a similar altitude, 10,000 foot runway, and really rarely is weather affected. We have like, I think it's 98.5% completion rate last year, like literally 1.5% of flights canceled or diverted. And so we don't have trouble with that. We have operational challenges, just like anybody. One flight gets delayed, we don't have enough bodies with one airline to handle it and a flight will get delayed. An American specifically has had trouble over the last 12 months. And so we're working with them. And Lloyd and I, very hands-on, like probably deeper into that building than anybody wants us. Um, but we are certainly bringing it up. And we are sending photos and tracking information and working with all the angles that he and I have within that airline to make sure that they have a better winner than they did last year. But in general, we are very fortunate and very lucky. You know, in winter, 15 minute delays, are, are not uncommon. But as long as we're getting people where they're going and with a, the bulk of those connections made, we're, we're in very good shape, actually. I um, worked in Ogden for a number of years and did quite a bit of traveling. And as, as you know, Ogden is a large city, but it's close to Salt Lake, so they do not have a functioning airport. Um, I traveled quite a bit to Missoula, and um, they had a three-legged flight that flew from Salt Lake to Missoula to Kalispell back to Salt Lake. Have you looked at any arrangements like that where uh, there might be a number of businesses that um, individually don't support the uh, amount of seats that you would need, but um, by having a couple of smaller airports with business needs, it um, can maybe add um, a half hour to the flight time, but it saves quite a bit. Yeah, it's actually a strategy we've used in Telluride. It's interesting too because 
you know, in your analogy, the, the winner and the need on that equation is Kalispell, right? They, they wouldn't have service without that three-legged flight. So Telluride is kind of Kalispell. Montrose is bigger than Kalispell. Montrose is the Missoula. And so, you know, we don't necessarily need to piggyback Montrose at this point, but Telluride we've tried to piggyback with a number of things. Cortez, Kingman, Arizona, Phoenix, and so, and it's been moderately successful, but it's a good strategy when you have kind of one other community that's physically a little too far to drive to that could use at least a modicum of air service, and that's kind of more the text piece of the puzzle, and, and, and we have tried it up there. You know, I think what we found with both our business and our guests, though, is, is they don't like it. Unfortunately, our customers, people only get on if they have to with an extra stop. And, and it's, I think, a, a result of our success. They would rather drive up here for an hour and fly direct, nonstop, um, especially with now Chicago added into that mix. And so I think we're pretty lucky that we've kind of developed maybe one step past that uh, with what we're doing. The Telluride Airport is a unique animal and challenge. And so I would definitely entertain that up there further, and I think down here we're in good enough shape where we can kind of be the big piece of that puzzle. Well, you know, maybe everybody in this room has encountered the mystery of the airfares that are can be vary so much. Uh, I booked an airfare from Denver to Dublin, Ireland, round trip for seventeen dollars. Uh, Ryanair? No, 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 and it wasn't the one that they shipped the sheep over to Ireland. <laughs> you know, you you know they, the so the, the bill said, the receipt said it was $17 round trip airfare, $450 taxes and fees. Okay, well it was still, it was still a bargain. Uh, uh, and it was in June, so it wasn't on January 10th or something like that. But could you shed some, if you're able to do so, could you shed some light and maybe help us out on how we might be able to figure out how to fly out of Montrose uh, without having to drive to Denver or Salt Lake City? I mean, when I, usually when I look at Montrose airfares, they are uh, discouragingly high. And uh, it would be helpful, I'm sure, to everyone in this room and also to your Colorado Flight Alliance to uh, maybe help us out here on, give us some tricks of the trade, maybe, or some insights on how we can fly out of Montrose at a reasonable price. Definitely, and there's definitely tricks. And that's actually what the other thing is hopefully going to have. There'll be some video, like I have a page on my website that's got basically how-tos, but it, it's this will be much more in-depth on and it, it's not a ton of different secrets, but there's definitely things. And so, you know, ultimately adding the Montrose leg is gonna depend on the time of year and demand on that leg, first of all. It's gonna gauge how much, if you wanted to fly to Dublin, like through, sometimes it'll be almost the same price as Denver. And so how do you manage that? And here's the funny thing, it's, it's like an arc you have to manage. When a flight first goes live, and they usually book their schedules about 11 months ahead of time, right? Anywhere between 11 and seven months, they'll put that flight live in the system. When they put it up live, it's generally very expensive, all right, right as it goes into the system. So if you're too far out, and of course this is the fun balance to try to figure out, right, it's gonna look pretty bad, all right? And then you gotta let it settle for three or four weeks, and then it kind of settles into a groove. And so you have to make sure then that you're kind of monitoring, and depending on how much leeway you have, you definitely wanna book with a little window, at least seven days out, at least 14 days, at least 21 days, if you can do 30 days out, then that's kind of in your best window right there. And you want to make sure that you're, you're kind of monitoring that. And all of our search tools now, I use Kayak a lot, I use google.com backslash flights. Uh, they all have trending and forecast tools on there. And in Google, I love it because if you pop the calendar open, it'll show all the days. And so this is the other secret. Try not to travel on the main business travel days or the main tourism travel days actually, like travel on Tuesday is basically what I'm saying. And so more or less if you could travel off cycle a little bit from a main holiday or even a main weekday or a main week travel day, you're gonna see those prices drop pretty dramatically. Um, you know, Labor Day is a great example. I was trying to find my mom in, you know, just last minute. Thursday flights were like 850 bucks. But if you wanna fly in here on Friday, it was like 375 or Saturday, like two days later, right? So if you could manage, to get off that cycle. So back to Google, if you hit the calendar, it'll actually show you the fare every day. 
like through that month. And so if you're flexible, you can pick a day. So make sure to book out front. Uh, try to be flexible if you can. And then explore. I mean, I, I look at all of the airports in this region as an advantage, right? Look at Junction, look at Durango, look at Montrose. And, you know, the airlines are very, very good at this, right? The minute, let's say, our 70-seat jet here has 37 people on it, that price is going to kick up to the next level. The minute it has 60 on it, it's going to go through the roof, right? And so maybe on one of those days, our flights are full, but maybe Junction's having an off-business day. And so at that point, you could find a way up and down the corridor here to find a cheaper flight and just compare and contrast. Because, you know, I, I figure that the business is going to flow around. We get a ton of business from Junction. They get a ton from us. You know, it goes back and forth, and I think helps both. And so... This site will actually have uh, some videos that, and they're already built on YouTube, we're kind of working on cleaning them up, that basically shows you how to go in and book, and where the best, the, the, the secrets and the tricks of the trade are. Um, that's kind of the basics that I have, you know, it's not super complicated. The other ways to do it are mix your miles, if you've got miles, mix in miles and costs, a lot of times that will help. Uh, and then ultimately you can patch legs together if you really want to. Like you can fly the Denver Air Connection out of Junction or Telluride and then fly out of Denver or drive up. But th those would be my quick and, quick and early you know, strategies that I use when I'm going out to book for the family. So this uh, question is about uh, customer experience. We're going to be going to the airport next week and, and you know, touring that and everything else. Uh, the question I have is, um, what uh, blowback are you getting from uh, from customers uh, on our ex our airport? It's growing 60 percent. You know, there's got to be some deficiencies. Um, you know, there's parking issues. Uh, the fact that the um, uh, it's difficult or impossible to get like a Uber or a Lyft to take you someplace because of the uh, fees that the county charges. What are uh, what are some of the things that you might recommend to the county uh, to improve the airport as far as customer experience goes? Well, since they're all sitting in this room, um, <laughs> we have those conversations with our partners ongoing. And actually, Lloyd and I work hands on this together, and I really appreciate Lloyd's openness in this conversation because I'm really just the planning guy, right? Um, you know, the airport's improvements over the last several years have actually kept pace. You know, we, I would say four years ago now, three years ago, we hit our head pretty hard. Like we had, I didn't, on my end, arrange the schedule with enough window between the flights. TSA didn't have quite enough capacity. One of our airlines didn't have enough desk and it all combined to create a pretty tough experience through the winter. You know, I would be proud to say that within a year we had solved most of those pieces of the puzzle. And that's just an example because it's not like solved. It's like year to year, right? It's ongoing. And right now, as you saw last year, TSA has now massively expanded with the third lane and pre-check, so TSA is not a choke point at this point, as far as we know. Um, you know, the airlines have improved desk space. We've, you know, the airline built out the two extra desks in front of the business center. Have you already, Lloyd, have you already announced your current project, or should I save that for you? That's next week. Okay. There's another project going on in the backside of the airport that's really cool and exciting that Lloyd's going to tell you about next week. Um, that allows for larger capacities to flow through there. Like right now, just as an example, I didn't mean to call out one airline, but like right now, we're having one airline who tends to have most of the, of the choke points associated with it. So we're working specifically with them to make sure. And so we survey this. We take you know, upwards of 700 to 1,000 surveys in that airport every winter to make sure. And it's like four times the, the number we need for a valid sample to make sure. And generally, the airport reviews are positive. Like we, the shuttle reviews are positive, the airport experience is positive. Etc. And and you know we run into some problems on Saturdays. And it's weird. And sometimes like on the odd Tuesday where a flight would be delayed or two or three, and they'll pile on each other, and the bags will come out slow, and we'll take some hits there. But we try to make sure we know that we're going to have individual challenges like that. But we also try to make sure, and Lloyd can certainly speak to this in, in, in probably better depth, that in, in the long term, are we managing this effectively on a day-to-day -day basis, like getting the bags out quick enough, check-in not taking forever, getting people through TSA, is there food back there? all those things. Uh, and, and we definitely pay attention. Like we fund guest services out there. Our organization does along with the city of Montrose and uh, you can tell you right, Tourism Board is our third partner in that one. Um, and so trying to make sure that there is a good guest experience. You can't believe how far cookies go. It's like the, the greatest airport invention ever apparently with a chocolate chip cookie. And so that solves a lot of problems when you have some delays or, or bags are taking a little extra long. Uh, the other question when it comes to local transportation and Uber, 
Like this city feels like it's right on the verge of having enough demand, but I think it's a demand question more than a county question, but it is squarely out of my bailiwick, out of my area of expertise, and maybe something you guys can ask uh, here. And it's funny, because I was driving up here, and the people at the Holiday Inn last night were like, hey, you should stay here. And I was like, it would be cool to stay here if I could Uber somewhere, because I had that exact same thought. Um, but, uh, but I think as we continue to grow, that inevitably we're going to see some of that coming down the pike. And, and honestly, Durango supports a local taxi with about 40,000 people in that county. Uh, and it's very minor, and kind of on Fridays and Saturdays and things, but I think that, you know, this, that, that Montrose County is probably right on the verge of that as well. I just add that I take Uber all the time in Montrose, so I never have a problem. What? Really? There's two, two, at, least two, one, at least one, but sometimes two drivers all the time. I've never had an issue. Wow, I, I didn't know, because honestly I had, myself had not found the driver pop up, and I had some airline people get stuck at the airport a few weeks ago. And so, great, <laughs> we're right there, it's coming. <laughs> Like, there's two drivers, and there's going to be four soon enough. That's great. Is this just kind of a, an, a question of interest? You are the only person, in my recollection, connected with Colorado Flights Alliance, this whole venture. Did, did you start it, Matt? And how did you get into this, and how has it evolved? Um, uh, no, I did not start this. This started in 2004. Uh, there were a couple referendums in Telluride and Mountain Village that actually passed follow post 9/11. Everybody got crushed with the airlines, and so they created a sustained funding mechanism in 04. And there's been three directors of this organization, uh, and actually the past director is the guy who's helping me on the back end with the fair search stuff because that's one of his skill sets. And then the third guy. I think Nick is a really good golfer. I don't know where he went. Um, but uh, but uh, he worked here uh, in the early 2000s. So no, I think I'm the third director in the history of the organization. And I came up through ski, uh, through public relations and marketing. So uh, I actually went to grad school in Missoula uh, and then had, had worked in ski before that. I started in public relations, uh, then worked my way up through marketing, uh, worked in Durango, I worked in Summit County. And then eventually was the Vice President of Marketing at Terry Ski Resort for a number of years uh, before moving into this job. And honestly, I, I love this job. I mean, this is a something much larger than larger than a resort, larger than yourself to, to work on. You know, it's a, it's a regional community benefit, a regional economic effort. And so I, I love working with the governments, with the airports, with the locals, uh, and, and, and all the partnership and the scope that it has because you feel like you can do some good. And, and that's what we're, you know, that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's our responsibility. So again, then, that's why I want to hear your feedback, ultimately, as to how we can move the ball forward. Can you talk a little bit about um, what you did with Warren Miller Films? <laughs> so like a lot of people out here, my wife and I thought that we might want to move to the front range. <laughs> and so uh, uh, for a while, she went to see you. And so I took a job uh, kind of in the middle of my Marketing years at the ski resort uh, as the VP of marketing for Ski Magazine, Ski Magazine, Warren Miller Films, and NASTAR Racing, and it was a lot of fun. But you realize that you have a film. It was it was owned by a like a New York corporate magazine company, so needless to say, their goals were different than you know kind of what the frontline ski industry people were looking at. But we got to travel all over. We made some great friends. We we did some really fun things, and that was yeah, definitely one of the, the sort of the career tangents and highlights. And I love it because like it didn't take very long for my wife and I to realize, and we, we try to find the right word for this, that we've been countryfied or frontierified or whatever. But after living up there for about six or eight months, we're like, we gotta go back. And so uh, luckily, I came back and slotted straight back into my old job. And so it worked out great. Uh, but thanks, that was just sort of a fun sideline. And you have a great board too, Matt. Yes, we do have a great board, of course. So two, uh, one current, one former member sitting in the room, and sort of, actually, two current, two de facto, like Lloyd, Barbara, Judy Ann, Bill, like, and, and that's the beautiful thing. Like, we do have a fantastic board. It, it mixes, we have Montrose County with the airport, city of Montrose, we have Telluride, Mountain Village, uh, the Telluride Airport and County, uh, a couple at large seats that are generally occupied by lodgers or retailers, and it's a really professional group of people, and they do deserve some credit and a shout out in helping this organization function smoothly, with helping explain, you know, within their sectors of the economy how this program works and, and what it can provide, and, and to take feedback too, as well as to what we can do 
Uh, so thank you to my board members who are here. Um, when you look at that map of flights, the northwest corner of the country, I think, is obviously absent. And I, and I love hearing the answer of just why that is. You know, Seattle's a tough one. Um, and, it's, and I mean that in a Colorado sense of the word. So I, I was the chair of the Colorado Tourism Office Board of Directors for the last two years. I was on that board for the last six, eight years. And so speaking from that level, the Northwest is a challenge for Colorado. And Vail's actually tried it over a 20-year period like three times. And I think that the Epic Pass and the, and the Icon Pass may actually help change this slightly. But we've always had a really hard time getting Seattle to travel to Colorado. They like, especially in the winter. And so they like, they have Whistler, they have Sun Valley. They're very loyal to Sun Valley. Uh, they have Tahoe um, and they have Jackson. And so with that geographical arc, Generally, if we're getting on a plane to ski, it's usually a quick one-stopper, and so we have trouble pulling them all the way into Colorado. And so that's why, in a nutshell, we're simplifying them. We just haven't seen a demand. When we ran those Salt Lake flights a number of years ago, and even with the ones we have now, everybody's thinking, oh, Salt Lake will connect right through. Well, they just don't in Portland. And so we're working on that now. We're in the Epic Partnership with the Vail Group, as I think all of you are probably aware, at the ski resort. And hopefully that's going to pull a few more of those folks on down. But ultimately, it's been a struggle. Steamboat has tried the Seattle flight with Alaska a couple of times, and, it, and it's hanging on. Like, it's not growing, and it's not going away. And so we're keeping an eye on it. If Hayden can pull it off, and it's a little bit of a different kind of destination in here, then you know maybe that's when we go back again. And we have great conversations with Alaska, actually. We've talked about San Diego with them. We've talked about LA. We've talked about a few different things. But Seattle would certainly be something, and it is a geographic hole in our network, and something, you know, just as a, an individual destination, but also as a state that we would like to solve. Any other questions? Uh, you've put a revenue floor uh, out for these airlines, so that their expenses are covered, and a little bit of profit. When they reach that point, uh, you take all the risk, can you take some of the profit as well? We have one airline that we have a profit share with. The other one's got kind of, I don't know, you want to call it wise or hardball or hardcore. <laughs> Realize that it was their asset and maybe they should keep the profit. And so we, we do have one of those left and we really appreciate it, but the other is basically just covered. Good question. How will we know when the B-17 is coming in? So that we can go view its... Uh... Arrival. You'll hear it. <laughs> <laughs> the airport will be closed for an hour, and you'll hear it. I think. Uh, but uh, when do you want? I mean, you're interested in watching it come land, Lloyd? Do you want to? Yeah. So as I understand it, it's going to come in Monday, and it'll be here all week. Um, during the forum presentation, we're going to bring that up on the commercial ramp because our tour is basically going to cover. Uh, the projects that we have going in terminal. So we're going to make it easy to get to the B-17 instead of having that clear down at the FBO. But uh, you can also go to um, tribute to aviation.com for details. Uh, but uh, we'll have it down on a commercial ramp for everybody to go through uh, next Wednesday. I'm sure you'll tell them next week so they can plan. What are the dates of the tribute? The 14, 15, 16? Oh. Yes, yeah, so the dates of the tribute are the 14th and 15th uh, each day from 9 to 4. Uh, can I see by show of hands who's been to the tribute before? <laughs> Most people? That's great. So for those of you who haven't been to the tribute, um, uh, it's a terrific community event. It's basically uh, based around education for the kids. And we're trying to expand it each year and uh, include more activities. So uh, I hope to see you all there. <coughs> the cost is zero. It is a free event for the, uh, the citizens of Montrose and the region. So. Um, Thanks to our partners for helping us to keep that cost zero. Uh, I think Pat has some posters, and on the poster there you'll see uh, all the participating partners, and we certainly appreciate uh, their help with this. There's another Do you question. know how many 
many aircraft are scheduled to come in? So that kind of ebbs and flows. Um, for in, yesterday we had a, an aircraft called the Takamo that canceled, and we had two helicopters that signed up. So because most of these are military aircraft, um, up until the very day of the event, we will have people sign up and drop off. But right now we have about 40 aircraft and about 150 uh, participating military personnel. Okay, thank you so much for that information. And thank you so much, Matt, for all the information you've provided for us and the great ideas for how to um, get good deals in the future with your new website. And, and uh, let's go ahead and give him a hand. For the rest of the Beautiful background. Montrosefire.com. That, that will be the website. Okay. And, uh, and I look forward to bringing that. Just thanks all for having me. I always love coming down, and you know, don't hesitate to reach out during the year as well. Any questions? Thanks. And Catherine's going to be telling us about a little bit more about the airport tour next week. So we're not going to be meeting here. We're going to be meeting at the airport. A lot has been covered, but not parking and where will we meet. So as you turn into the airport, at the airport sign, there is a dirt parking lot to the south. So it'll be to your left. And you're supposed to, if you want, to your right. If you want free parking, park there. And then go in the south doors. And Lloyd said we're going to meet by the business um, area. Yes. And that is just beyond the ticketing. Right? Correct. And that we will be there to guide you. Those of us who are foreign facilitators will get there early, so we make sure you don't get lost. But because it's a TSA airport, we need to stick together as a group. You can't go off on your own and go wandering. So we will meet as a group and we'll stay together as a group. This is really special that uh, Lloyd gets us all TSA cleared all at once to get to do this, um, to go out on the ramp, to see the B-17, as had, they've already announced, he'll talk about construction, future plans. It'll be a real fun time. We did this last year, and he actually took us up to the ARP building, right? Yes, the aircraft rescue firefighting. Yes, and I had never been in that building before, and. It was kind of like going into a control tower room. It's been really fun. So um, hopefully we'll see you next week again, park in the dirt lot, enter the south doors. We'll be there to guide you to our gathering spot. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.